Hi, I'm Tim Berglund with Confluent. I'm in Cornwall Park near scenic One Tree Hill in Auckland, New Zealand right now to tell you all about Apache Kafka 2.4. Now I want to take you through a few KIPs, that's Kafka Improvement Proposals. Uh, those are kind of big projects that have made it into this release. I'm going to group them into three categories. That's Kafka Core, Kafka Connect, and Kafka Streams. First is KIP 392, Allow to Fetch from Nearest Replica. Now before this KIP, a consumer would always consume, it would always read, from the lead partition. There were follower partitions, but they were just there for redundancy. They couldn't be read from. Now we can read from those, potentially. There's two important configurations here, client rack and broker rack. Now, broker rack is a broker level configuration. That's just a name of the rack or availability zone or data center or whatever that that broker is in. Likewise, client rack is that same thing, whatever availability zone, data center, physical rack uh, that that client is in. And if that client is matched to the broker rack of a follower that's in sync, that client can potentially read from that partition, that follower partition on that broker. This can be great for some cloud deployments. Uh, you might get uh, clients and partitions in different availability zones, and you get lots of network ingress and egress charges moving uh, through the public internet across availability zones. Uh, this can help eliminate that, so it can make cloud deployments a much friendlier thing. Next is KIP 455, Implement an Admin API for Replica Reassignment. Now, prior to this KIP, to initiate replica reassignment, that is to move a replica from one broker to another, you actually had to interact directly with ZooKeeper. There was this well-known node that you'd write to, you'd give it a batch of partitions to reassign, and then it would go do those things. It would, it would do the work of reassigning those partitions, which can involve moving a lot of data over the network. And you couldn't cancel that once it was in progress, and you couldn't change it. You couldn't add new replicas uh, or new partitions to that reassignment operation. Now that ZooKeeper interface is replaced with a proper method in the admin client for getting this work done. Also, that new API does support canceling of a partition reassignment already in progress or adding new partitions to a batch that's currently being worked on. Next is KIP 480, the sticky partitioner. Now, imagine you've got a producer that's producing with a null key. I know, who would do such a thing, right? It's terrible. And not only is there no key, but also in the produce operation, it's not using any of the APIs for specifying what partition to write to. So what do you get? Well, you get round robin behavior at that point, right? The produce operation has no opinion about to what partition these messages should be written. And so you get round robining between the partitions, which is fine and fair and great. But as you can see in the diagram, as the number of partitions in a topic increases, you get increasing latency also. That's because this round robining um, plays poorly with the way network buffering works. And you end up getting a lot of small batches of the network, which is a recipe for bad latency. Now, with the sticky partitioner, when you've got this null key situation and, and messages just being produced with, uh, you know, to, to whatever partition, rather than round robining, it'll keep producing to the same partition until the buffer fills up or until this linger.ms parameter, the number of milliseconds to linger on a partition until we pass that and then it will round robin. So this just lets us fill up buffers a little bit better and get better, much better latency, almost flat latency with uh, partition size as you can see in the diagram. Now KIP 482, the Kafka protocol should support optional fields and these are actual KIP names. So the Kafka protocol, it should support optional fields, and now it does, now that this KIP has been merged. Now, in the RPC interface that is used, for example, between brokers and a Kafka cluster, there is this strongly typed serialization format. It's also used in various structures on disk, like uh, storing offset indexes and things like that. So the serialization format shows up in different places in Kafka. It's strongly typed. Before this KIP, it was not possible for a field to be nullable and it was not possible to add optional fields, kind of like uh, tagged fields, like if you wanted to add a uh, transaction ID or a uh, content type or, or something that some header-like thing like that, you couldn't do it. Now with this KIP, you can. The KIP also provides more efficient storage of variable length fields, so just some improvements all around to serialization. Now, KIP 496, admin API to delete consumer offsets. Now remember that consumer offsets are stored in a topic in Kafka, and they're not eternal. We need some way for making them go away, because a consumer group might be created and then destroyed and go away forever. Uh, this could happen, for example, with KSQL. If you're doing a lot of KSQL queries or Kafka streams, 
uh, applications. This, this could cause a lot of sort of transient consumer groups to be created and destroyed. We don't want all those offsets hanging around forever. They used to just be expired by timestamp. Now, KIPP 211 changed that. It took away that timestamp expiration thing and said, hey, look, if you're a part of an extant consumer group, the consumer group has not gone away, your offsets will live forever. And that KIPP took away the ability to specify the timestamp at which those offsets should be deleted. KIPP 496 gives us an explicit API for deleting consumer offsets. Now there's an intentional way using an admin API call to delete consumer offsets for a consumer group that you're not using anymore. KIPP 504 adds a new Java authorizer interface. Now, as you may know, Kafka was originally written in Scala, and the default client libraries kind of on the outer surface that developers see of Kafka were also Scala libraries. Not true anymore. It really is a Java program, and all the APIs on the outside are Java also. Now, Kafka has always supported pluggable authorizers using a Scala trait. That's Kafka Security Auth Authorizer, that Scala trait. KIPP 50 tried to replace that with a Java interface. That KIPP was accepted, but never merged. So KIPP 504 finally replaces the Scala trait. The Scala trait is still there, but it now adds the option to do this with a Java interface, which just makes the API a little bit more compatible with the way most people are writing Kafka programs. The interface also supports a few other things, like batching of authorization requests, asynchronous ACL updates, and some better audit capabilities, and more dynamic reconfiguration support. So just some upgrades to authorization in general, and a Java interface, much easier to implement pluggable authorizers in this way. KIPP 525, return topic metadata and configs in create topics response. Now, when you make a create topics call, you batch up some topics that you want to create. It's this administrative API call. Say, hey, go create these topics. Before this KIPP, the reply was, gotcha, they're created. Uh, just a, a, an indication of success or failure. Now that reply returns all the metadata. It tells you, yes, okay, here it worked. Uh, here are the partitions. Here's everything that you would want to know that you would normally have had to do with another call to read that metadata. Now you just get all that back in the return. So just some convenience. It's information you probably want anyway. And even if you don't, it's not real expensive that you get it. So this is an improvement to that API. So that does it for the most important core Kafka KIPs in Kafka 2.4. Now let's look at what's happened in Kafka Connect. KIPP 382, Mirror Maker 2.0. Now, Mirror Maker has been around for a while. It was originally intended as a tool to help you do multi-data center Kafka deployments, but it had some problems and didn't really succeed very well in that capacity. For example, when it would create a topic, it would always use broker configs on the destination side. Maybe that was like the wrong number of partitions. So you'd end up with source and destination topics with different partitions. It wouldn't replicate ACLs, wouldn't replicate any config. All these problems like that really got in the way. So Mirror Maker 2.0 attempts to address these and many other things. This is a detailed KIP you'll probably want to read about. And it's got some features to help avoid replication cycles between active, active data center deployments. That's a situation where you've got one topic in either data center, both of them are being produced to. And so you have to have messages uh, replicated from one topic in one data center to the other and the other way. Uh, there used to be problems with replication cycles that Mirror Maker didn't handle very well. Mirror Maker 2.0 just gives you some upgrades in this area. KIPP 495 allows us to dynamically adjust log levels in Connect. Now, of course, Connect is busily logging all kinds of things. You've got various Connect workers, various connectors, all of these really programs emitting their own logging. And when you're trying to sort out something going wrong with a Connect task uh, or you know a Connect operation or connector, uh, there's a lot of logs to sort through. And you're going to probably have that on a fairly coarse logging level until you need to dig into something. And then you want to turn on debug logging, for example, and, and really go crazy. Well, prior to this KIP, you had to restart the Connect cluster. And of course, that's a pain because that can affect behavior and make it hard to find a problem. Now, there's an endpoint in the REST interface that lets you do this dynamically at runtime so you can move logging up and down to troubleshoot things as you're working with your Connect cluster. KIPP 507, securing the internal Connect REST endpoint. Now, your interface as a developer to a Connect cluster is RESTful, right? There's this REST endpoint on the worker, and you can do gets and posts and puts and do all these things to that interface to uh, configure connectors, start, stop, get status, do whatever it is you need to do. It's possible to secure that interface. We can add authentication and authorization uh, to that endpoint. Also, the Connect workers have their own internal REST interface that they're using to talk to each other. This is not a thing that we do as developers using the cluster, uh, but they do, uh, the Connect workers do amongst themselves. Until this KIP, 
that was not securable. So that was an attack surface that this KIP closes up. Uh, we can now add authentication and authorization, make sure that traffic is encrypted, and only the right people are doing that connecting. That is, only other connect workers are able to talk to each other. KIP 440, extend the connect worker to support headers. Now, messages in a Kafka topic, they have what? They have a key and a value. They can also have headers, which are gonna be these optional other kind of metadata fields. I had mentioned these earlier in one of the core Kafka KIPs or something similar. They're like tags, right? Content type, transaction ID, user ID, whatever that might be, uh, you can optionally include them or not, and they're just separate metadata from the actual message key and value. Now, the Connect Converter historically has not properly supported headers. This KIP adds these two default methods, as you see on the slide, that now accept headers as a parameter. So, if you are relying in, say, your deserializer in a consumer uh, on something in headers telling the deserializer what to do, this is a pretty common use case of headers, is to use them basically to, at runtime, configure the behavior of a deserializer and the messages in that topic are being produced by a uh, Connect cluster, uh, now we can basically get those headers right. Uh, we can have Connect set those headers in a way that that consumer deserializer will be happy with. That does it for Kafka Connect. Now let's look at Kafka Streams. First is KIP 213, support non-key joining in K tables. Now, prior to this KIP, any kind of join, that's stream stream, stream table, table table, all of those required a common key. The join is done on the key. And that key, that propagates down to the topic itself. Okay, that's the message key. And the message key of the underlying topics of those tables or those streams had to be the same. And so you might have to do a little bit of repartitioning, rekeying to get a join to work. And this is pretty normal and expected. With this KIP, we now have the ability to join on non-key fields just in K tables. This doesn't affect table stream joins or stream stream joins, but if you're joining tables, you can use a key that's just a field in the value, and you can still make that join work. A nice improvement as a result of KIP 213. KIP 307, allowed defining custom processor names with the KStreams DSL. And thank you. So when you're creating a complex topology, uh, there are various processors that get created along the way. Anytime you do an operation that creates a new processor node in the graph, that thing gets a name. And those names are not what we would call, you know, friendly. Sometimes they have just long numbers, like a 10 number suffix on them and some kind of oblique prefix. And they're, they're unique. And you can always dump a text serialization of the topology out. And there are some nice tools online to render those as, as graphs. And so it's a solvable problem. But you might want to give those things a friendly name. So, and this KIP adds the with name method. So anytime you create a, a new processor, just dot with name and give it a friendly name. And when you're looking at your topology, you'll have that name. It can make big topologies a lot easier to debug. Finally, we have KIP 471, expose RocksDB metrics in Kafka Streams. Now, the default state store that Kafka Streams uses is RocksDB. It uses that as an internal key value store and an on-disk serialization of any state that a uh, streams process needs. And RocksDB, of course, exposes all its own metrics. It's a little database. It's this little log-structured storage tree, really interesting thing all by itself, and you might want to know what's going on with it at any given moment. Now, to get at those metrics, historically, you either have to use JNI, or you get it to dump them out to a file, and you read the file, and nobody wants that. Like, we're using computers for this. Why not have Kafka Streams do that? So now it does. So Kafka Streams is willing to report all of the RocksDB metrics, and you don't have to tiptoe around work and get a crowbar in and break those things loose. Now they're exposed for you. So that's what we have. Core Kafka, Kafka Connect, Kafka Streams. Those are the key KIPs that are a part of Apache Kafka 2.4. Go check it out for yourself. Dig into these things, read the KIPs, put them to use, and see what you can do.